For many centuries, humanity considered the Earth as the center of the solar system, the center of the universe. Now we know that it's very far from the truth. Moreover, the Earth and the Sun are not as special as we used to think about them. There are millions of planets just like ours, and millions of stars just like the Sun. But what does this exactly mean for us? Well, all of these facts are speaking for themselves. It's highly possible that we're not alone in space after all. Exciting, huh? The possibility of the presence of another civilization in our universe has been haunting humanity for many centuries. And while the thought of not being all alone in space is very tempting, it also brings up a lot of questions. And here is the main one. Do we really have a chance to find another civilization on another planet? Or at least some simple forms of life? Well, with our technology nowadays, we made advanced searches in our solar system. And while we didn't find any extraterrestrial intelligence, there have been some interesting discoveries. Today, we will take you on a small journey to our neighbor space objects. Together, we will see which ones were considered more suitable for life and if any forms of life were ever found on them. We will tell you how scientists search for both microorganisms on asteroids and advanced civilizations that allegedly can collect all of the energy of a star or even an entire galaxy. Let's go. The first space object that was considered to have life on it was, of course, the moon. Well, it really had it once in a while in the early 70s, when 12 astronauts were landing on it. Moreover, they were able to collect some samples. Unfortunately, the soil samples didn't have any signs of life. By the way, after the astronauts returned from the moon, they were being placed in a mobile quarantine facility which was a converted Airstream trailer. The crew was spending 21 days there. The purpose of the quarantine was the prevention of the spread of any possible infections from the moon, although their existence was very unlikely. The quarantine requirement was eliminated after Apollo 14, once it was proven that the moon was sterile. But does that mean that our nearest cosmic body is lifeless? Well, we can't be so sure about that. On the surface of the moon, of course, the conditions are tough, but under it, they can be much closer to the Earth. For now, we know at least two things for sure. First, there is definitely water on the moon in the form of ice blocks. And second, under the surface of the moon, the temperature is not dropping as much as on it, from 200 degrees to minus 150 degrees Celsius. Anyway, there are still many things that we haven't discovered yet about our satellite. Dozens of meteorites have been found on Earth that came from Mars. Hundreds of samples came from the Moon, fully independently, not brought by astronauts or vehicles. These samples were just simply knocked out by meteorites and jumped to Earth. Obviously, vice versa also happens a lot. Some pieces from Earth sometimes fly in the direction of the moon, so it would be very interesting to discover how and where Earth microbes end up while traveling to the moon. Did they die, or maybe they somehow adapted there? Well, for now, we don't have the exact answers. Anyway, the other objects in our solar system that were commonly considered to have life on them were Venus and Mars. But why exactly Venus? Well, depending on the distance from the Sun, the planets receive different amounts of heat. So there is already a relatively small range of distance from the Sun that is considered as a zone of possible life. So in the habitable zone, the temperature on the surface of the planet is close to Earth's, and by that we mean that it's from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. This is the range where water can be in a liquid state at normal pressure. And, well, water is life, at least for all the creatures that we are familiar with on Earth. But there's something more. 
the habitable zone gradually moves away from the sun. When our star was younger, it did not heat the planets that much, and the zone of life was a little closer to the star. At that time, the planet Venus was in the habitable zone. The first photos of Venus came to Earth in the 60s, after American and Soviet spacecraft flew by. These images immediately revealed two interesting facts. First, the atmosphere of Venus rotates very quickly, while the planet itself rotates very slowly, namely in 243 Earth days. This spinning occurs in the opposite direction, not in the direction of its movement around the Sun. Astronomers still haven't found any explanation for that. The very slow rotation of the planet is also a mystery that is yet to be discovered. Another thing is the Venus atmosphere that lives its own life. The upper cloud layers are rapidly flying around it. This is called super rotation. As a result, the atmosphere seems to be divided into two parts. One part of the cloud layer in the form of a giant spiral is wound on one pole. The second part in the form of a second giant spiral is wound on the north pole. At the pole, the gas rushes into the funnel and descends into the lower atmosphere and returns to the equator. There is no detailed explanation for this phenomenon either. Before these observations, the conditions of Venus seemed very close to those on Earth, and many considered it as a planet raging with life. But because of the dense atmosphere, which is almost entirely made up of carbon dioxide and nitrogen, the average temperature on the planet's surface is about 500 degrees Celsius. The conditions there are very harsh. Most possibly, Venus doesn't have any form of life, and probably never has. The next cosmic body in the habitable zone is Mars. This planet, too, for almost 100 years, seemed to be quite a good place for the life of extraterrestrial civilizations. In the middle of the 19th century, some thin lines were discovered on the surface of Mars, which were named channels. It has been suspected that intelligent beings built a system to pump water from the polar caps to the arid equatorial regions. Of course, today we realize that it was just an illusion. We sent several vehicles to the Mars surface that conducted biological experiments. None of them found any microbes. Most likely, the surface of Mars is lifeless. It is not covered tightly with a layer of the atmosphere as on Earth. Therefore, ultraviolet light, X-rays, and solar cosmic rays are constantly burning it which makes the possibility of life there impossible. But that's not all. As with the Moon, the conditions under the surface of Mars can be much better. Below, we can supposedly find water, a comfortable temperature, and protection from radiation. And what's most important, we already know places on Mars where it's possible to go under the surface. Scientists have found on the red planet some round entrances to vertical caves situated on the Martian shield volcano Arzia Mons. They are pretty large, about 100 meters in diameter. On Earth, we call them sinkholes. And well, who knows what is in the depths of these caves. However, it's still unclear how we can send a machine there and get all the necessary data. One more important discovery. In 2009, with the help of spacecraft and ground-based telescopes, areas with methane were discovered. On Earth, it's usually a product of life activity, either cattle or microorganisms. Another source of methane is volcanic activity, but the red planet has cooled down a long time ago. Now we don't see any active volcano there. So, where's the methane coming from? We don't know that now. And one more fact. In 1984, a fragment of a Martian meteorite called Allen Hills 84001 was discovered in Antarctica. After taking air samples from the meteorite, 
The scientists concluded that this is the atmosphere of Mars. But what exactly was so intriguing about this object? After carefully scanning the structure of the meteorite with a microscope, scientists discovered fossilized structures that are very similar to our terrestrial bacteria. Moreover, they even saw supposed traces of their life activity. The structures resemble some modern terrestrial bacteria and their appendages. Though some are much smaller than any known extant Earth microbes, others are in the order of 100 to 200 nanometers in size, within the size limits of Pelagibacter ubique, the most common bacteria on Earth, which ranges from 120 to 200 nanometers. Well, just like the hypothetical Martian nanobacteria. RNA organisms, which are expected to have lived on Earth during the time period when the meteorite was ejected from Mars, may also have been as small or smaller than these structures. But some of the structures are even larger, 1 to 2 microns in diameter. The smallest structures are too small to contain all the systems required by modern life. Were they microorganisms? We can't be sure about that. As you could notice, there's still a possibility that the other planets of the solar system have some forms of life on them. We're going to tell you everything about the latest discoveries of astronomers. We always wondered if we are alone in the whole universe. For the last seven decades, it became one of the most important questions for astronomists. They try to catch signals through radio and research space with the help of spacecraft. Of course, the most advanced search with today's technology is possible in our home, the solar system. And although during these years we haven't found anything that confirmed the existence of life on other planets, we managed to research some space objects that can actually be home to extraterrestrial life. And today, we would like to share some mind-blowing facts about them. Join us in the Search for Extraterrestrial Civilizations, Part 2. And don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons if you want to see another video from this series. There are definitely some objects in the solar system with conditions close to Earth's. As we know, each of the giant planets has numerous moons. Only Jupiter has 79 of them, and these objects attract the attention of many scientists. Biologists think that one of the moons, or, well, even a few of them, can have conditions for life. So let's get to know them. The solar system has some small ocean planets. One of them is Europa, the satellite of Jupiter. It's approximately 4.5 billion years old, about the same age as the planet around which it orbits. Also, it's the smallest one of the Galilean satellites, which are called that in the name of their discoverer, Galileo Galilei who first saw them in December 1609. The diameter of the Europa is slightly more than 3,000 kilometers, so it's smaller than the Moon but larger than Pluto. The average distance from Europa to the Sun is 780 million kilometers, and to Jupiter, 666,000 kilometers. It always faces its planet with only one side, just like our Moon. The duration of a European day is approximately 3.5 times that of a day on Earth. The conditions of the surface give no hope that there can be any kind of life. The satellite moves inside the radiation belts of Jupiter, which are very powerful. But that's not all. There has been some interesting data obtained by the Galileo probe, which explored the Jupiterian system from 1995 to 2003. According to that, under the layer of ice that covers Europa, there is a deep ocean of salt water. Okay, but why are we sure it's salty? Well, Europa has a magnetic field. In this case, only salt water can be the conductor of electricity. Also, with the help of spectral analysis, scientists managed to find sodium chloride on the surface of Europa. Table salt almost entirely consists of it. It's also the main component of sea salt. 
All of this data suggests that Europa's oceans may be similar to those on Earth. The depth of this ocean, together with the layer of surface ice, can reach from 80 to 170 kilometers. If we took 100 kilometers as the satellite ocean's average depth and collected all the water on Europa in the ball, then the radius of this ball would be 877 kilometers. Moreover, there is more water on Europa than on all the Earth's oceans combined. Although our oceans are vast, they're not so deep, about four kilometers on average. The main source of heat on Europa is tidal heating, a deformation under the influence of the planet's gravity. It's powerful enough to keep the ocean in a liquid state. As you know, living organisms feel good in the subglacial lakes of Antarctica. Therefore, nothing prevents them to do the same in Europa. The Galileo probe showed strange pits and domes on the surface, so it's possible that the ice layer of the satellite cracks due to heat from below. Long, linear cracks are often only one to two kilometers wide, but can stretch thousands of kilometers across Europa's surface. Some of these have developed into 100 meters high ridges, while others diverged into wide bands with several other fractures. But how can we get to the ocean? The ice layer of Europa is around 20 to 30 kilometers. We still don't have any technology that can drill that. But some scientists suggested that since the ice is cracking, then maybe the water comes out to the surface itself and they were right. The Hubble Space Telescope has spotted some powerful water geysers there. Unfortunately, in the Jupiter system, there wasn't any probe at that time that could study everything. But Europa remains one of the most attractive places for the extraterrestrial life search. The second giant planet of our solar system is Saturn. It also has many satellites, but Enceladus is the one that gets most of the attention. It is one of the smallest moons of Saturn with a regular spherical shape, but it's the largest among inner satellites. Its distance from Saturn is 237,000 kilometers. A flyby around it takes 33 hours for Enceladus. And just like Europa and our moon, it also faces its planet with one side. Enceladus is very small. The average radius of the satellite is only 0.04 of the Earth's. Also, it's covered in ice. When the Cassini spacecraft flew to the night side of Enceladus, it saw streams of water that hit directly into space from the cracks. No doubt, there was liquid water under the ice. Cassini flew right through these emissions. It examined these pieces of ice and proved that it is salt water with minerals. There is a hint that there are black smokers at the bottom of this ocean, which are throwing out mineral-rich water. And as we know, liquid water is one of the main conditions for life. Anyway, today we are talking not just about the search for life, but also about the search for intelligent extraterrestrial life. In this case, it's quite difficult to imagine that some kind of civilization could live under the ice. But perhaps there are some microorganisms. Although, let's not forget that nature is richer than we can imagine. And it works in magical ways. Now let's talk about another interesting satellite of Saturn, Titan. It was called that because it's quite huge more precisely, 1.5 times bigger than the Moon. It can be called a full-fledged planet, although a small one. Titan has a dense atmosphere, which is very similar to Earth's. But there is no oxygen, and only nitrogen atmosphere by 95%. The rest, what about the search for extraterrestrial intelligent civilizations? At the end of the 50s, we started to think that our civilization was developed enough for contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. Then, in 1959, physicists realized that our radio engineering is actually at a very high level. 
gigantic antennas were needed to communicate with far-flung probes. At that moment, this was the biggest reflector that was capable of transmitting radio messages directionally. It could also receive very weak signals coming from space. Two American physicists, Cuccioni and Philip Morrison, published a short note about that in the Nature magazine. If another star on the planet had the same radio receivers and the same radio transmitters as ours, then radio communication would be possible. We could establish the exchange of messages. Also, it was necessary to decide on several key things. The frequency needed to look for radio signals from space, the right direction for the antenna, and the form of the received signals. The first question was resolved pretty quickly. Space is filled with hydrogen. It's almost the only substance that can be found everywhere. Hydrogen has a 21 centimeter long line of radiation, and this is a natural landmark that could understand any civilization that started to explore space. On a 21 centimeter wave, the whole universe makes noise. The first person who tuned the radio to this wave was Frank Drake. He directed it to the nearest stars that were similar to our sun. And how did that experiment go? We will tell you about it in the next video of our Search for Extraterrestrial Civilization series. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is home to more than 100 billion stars. Only the observable universe contains more than 100 billion galaxies. Huge numbers, huh? But that's not all. Let's assume that on average, there is at least one planet per star. And that's just a fair minimum. Usually they have more. Therefore, we can say there's an almost uncountable amount of planets. And if so, can it be that there's life in any of it? maybe even life as developed and sophisticated as ours. Or maybe something even bigger and smarter. Well, already for centuries, humanity is determined to find the answers. Search for the other civilizations started in ancient times. We always wondered, are we all alone in the universe? Still, it remains one of the biggest questions of humanity. We're desperately searching for the signs of extraterrestrial life. But what if I tell you that maybe we already have them? Today, we'll explore how the search for extraterrestrial intelligence started. Who were the first scientists trying to get messages from space? How the search is going nowadays? And did we get any messages from other civilizations? The search for messages from extraterrestrial civilizations actively started at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. It was highly inspired by the invention and further development of radio technology. Of course, one of the greatest inventors and engineers of that time, Nikola Tesla, was doing his own experiments in order to hear messages from space, more precisely, from Mars. At that time, many scientists believed that the Red Planet was inhabited by other civilizations. In 1899, Tesla detected some strange signals. The scientists believed that they were coming from Mars. His alleged discovery immediately caught media attention. This is how the Richmond Times was describing the incident. As he sat beside his instrument on the hillside in Colorado, in the deep silence of that austere, inspiring region, where you plant your feet in gold and your head brushes the constellations. As he sat there one evening, alone, his attention, exquisitely alive at that juncture, was arrested by a faint sound from the receiver. Three fairy taps, one after the other, at a fixed interval. What man who has ever lived on this earth would not envy Tesla at that moment? While newspapers were praising the engineer, scientists were not as much excited. 
Later, it was revealed that Tesla most probably was observing signals from Marconi's European radio experiments. Oh, yes, and speaking about Marconi, the scientist who is considered to be one of the founding fathers of radio technology also believed that he received messages from Mars. But again, as in the previous case, it wasn't proved by anything, although there were numerous publications about it in newspapers. Most of them later turned out to be fake. USA officials were also highly interested in receiving messages from Mars. On August 21, 1924, when Mars was closer than ever to Earth, they promoted a national day of radio silence. The citizens were asked to keep their radios quiet for five minutes on the hour, every hour, so the astronomers would be able to listen for potential signals from Earth. For that matter, a powerful radio receiver was strapped to a dirigible floating two miles up. Anyway, these efforts didn't bring any result. The scientists couldn't catch anything interesting. In the next three decades, the search kind of calmed down until 1959, when the scientific journal Nature published a paper by Giuseppe Cuccioni and Philip Morrison. It suggested that the detection of extraterrestrial civilizations of about the same technological level as ours is possible, provided that they are not too far from the Earth. Well, it's essential to mention that by not too far, we mean the nearest planetary systems. For example, the closest exoplanet Proxima b, which scientists call one of the most Earth-like planets, which is situated just 4.2 light years from us. The year 1959 is considered as a start point of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. It's a collective term for scientific searches for intelligent life outside of our planet. A year later, in 1960, the first modern SETI experiment took place. It was called Project Ozma, after Princess Ozma, ruler of the fictional Land of Oz, from Lyman Frank Baum's famous Oz series. During the experiment, a radio telescope with a diameter of 26 meters examined the stars Tau Ceti and Epsilon Iridani. Both of them are sun-like stars, so scientists suggested that they could have inhabited planets like Earth. A 400 kilohertz band was scanned around the marker frequency using a channel receiver with a bandwidth of 100 hertz. But the research didn't bring any significant results. One interesting signal was detected on April 8th in 1960, but shortly after, it was determined to have originated from a high-flying aircraft. Eleven years later, in 1971, NASA for the first time funded a SETI study. In the final report, the team of the study suggested the construction of an Earth-based radio telescope array with 1,500 dishes known as Project Cyclops. It was aimed to search for Earth-like radio signals at a distance of up to 1,000 light years. Cyclops was not built due to the high price of the project. At that time, its creation would cost around $10 billion. Anyway, the report has a very important role in the history of the search for other civilizations. It created the basis for future SETI projects. Okay, okay, so there were a lot of researchers and stuff. We get that. But did we at any point get a signal from another intelligence? Well, yeah. Actually, there was a signal that is considered to have an extraterrestrial origin. It was received on August 15, 1977, by Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope. Astronomer Jerry R. Eman discovered a strong narrow-band radio signal a few days later when he was reviewing the recorded data. He circled the data on the printout and wrote, Wow! on its side. And that's exactly how the signal got its name. The signal most probably came from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. The entire signal sequence lasted for the full 72-second window, during which Big Ear was able to observe it. 
The signal has not been detected since, despite many attempts. During the following decades, many scientists were trying to find its origin. In 2017, professor of astronomy from Florida, Antonio Paris, suggested that WOW signal was most likely generated by comets. Anyway, this hypothesis was dismissed by other astronomers, as the sighted comets were not in the beam at the correct time. Till now, this signal, received decades ago, is considered as a possible alien radio transmission. In the last few years, there was another signal that captured scientists' attention. It was detected by Arecibo Observatory astronomers. Strange radio signals were thought to originate from the star Ross 128. But soon after, astronomers from SETI's Allen Telescope Array did some observations and were unable to detect the signal. However, they revealed man-made interference. Most likely, these signals happened due to transmissions from Earth satellites in geosynchronous orbit. For many years, not only scientists, but also common enthusiasts were searching for the signals. One of the most significant SETI projects, SETI at Home, allowed everyone with a computer and internet connection to take part in the official search for signals from extraterrestrial civilizations. The scientists from Berkeley SETI Research Center wrote a program that allowed home computers to process signals received from the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico. The project launched in 1999. Over the 20 years, several million people installed the program and took part in the research. Unfortunately, in March of 2020, the project was officially closed. There were two reasons for that. First, the scientific value of the obtained data decreased. Second, the quantity of the data was so large that now researchers needed additional time to analyze the received signals and search for patterns. The scientists suggest that the resumption of SETI at home is possible if there are any other astronomical problems that require a large computation. Maybe at some point in the nearest future, we'll be able to become a part of another big research. So, it seems like in more than 60 years, SETI still hasn't found any confirmed signals from other civilizations. During that time, many scientists suggested many hypotheses and thoughts over the topic. One of them is the Fermi Paradox, named after Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi. It can be described in the following way. On the one hand, numerous arguments say that a significant number of technologically advanced civilizations should exist in the universe. On the other hand, there are no observations that would confirm that. The situation is paradoxical and leads to the conclusion that either our understanding of nature or our observations are incomplete or erroneous. As Enrico Fermi said, but where is everybody? Well, we still don't have the answer to that question. But the search actively continues. Moreover, we are sending messages ourselves, and they're very interesting. We'll tell you more about those signals and interesting concepts on extraterrestrial intelligence in our next videos. The Earth, that massive, powerful, and in so many ways, even scary planet. Yet, it's the most beautiful thing we ever saw in our lives. Mother to us, mother to every breathing creature we know and the fact that it's just a grain in a massive structure full of mysteries is mind-blowing. See for yourself. This is how Earth looks from the International Space Station. Amazing, right? The distance of the station from the surface of our planet is 408 kilometers. Well, we can easily imagine that. And the Earth still looks giant. So let's fly a little bit further. In this picture, our home is still very recognizable. 
the photo, called Earthrise, was taken from the moon by astronaut William Anders during the Apollo 8 mission in 1968. Truly breathtaking view, but can we go even further? Yes. This is the Earth pictured from Voyager 1 in 1990. In the photo called Pale Blue Dot, Earth's size is less than a pixel. That's how our home looks from 6 billion kilometers away. And that's how far man-created objects can go. Oh, wait. Actually, this wasn't enough for our space machines. They went even farther. And some probes are determined to do something incredible. Leave the solar system. And today, we'll try to answer the following questions. When exactly will the probes leave the system? Are we in touch with them? Will they ever reach the stars? And is there anything that can keep us from flying outside of our planetary system? Let's find out. Movie Interstellar at some point can make us believe that very soon we'll be able to leave our solar system. And while this idea can be really tempting, well, I should disappoint you. We shouldn't be too excited about that. The thing is, now only two objects created by humans are flying outside of our planetary system. Today, we'll tell you everything about these badass probes and also about the other objects that will soon join them in the Outside the Solar System party. Okay, so there are five man-made objects now leaving the solar system, and all of them are launched by NASA. How did they manage to escape the gravity well, their velocity is taking them away from the sun. On their distances, the gravitational pull is already not strong enough to make them come back. Probes already completed their main missions. Four of them were launched in the 20th century. And I should say, they accomplished some extraordinary things. Let's get to know these guys better. First, let me introduce you to the pioneers. Our first hero is Pioneer 10, launched in March of 1972. It has a speed of 45,000 kilometers per hour. Pioneer was the first NASA spacecraft with a nuclear-powered electrical source and the first spacecraft that traveled through the asteroid belt. Moreover, it did the first flyby of Mars and Jupiter. And also, it's the first artificial object which was able to develop velocity that will allow it to leave the solar system. As you see, the name of this spacecraft speaks for itself. It was the first in many things. True success story. Pioneer 10's last signal was received on January 23, 2003. According to NASA engineers, the radioisotope power source of the spacecraft has decayed, so we won't be able to receive any signals from it anymore. Pioneer 10 is now headed to the constellation of Taurus, in the direction of the star Aldebaran. It will require more than 2 million years for the spacecraft to reach it. The distance between Pioneer 10 and Earth is now more than 19 billion kilometers. Well, it's sad that we lost the connection with that special one. Enjoy the flight, fella. Number 2. Pioneer 11, launched in 1973 with a speed of 40,960 kilometers per hour. Its main objectives included studying the asteroid belt and the environment around Jupiter and Saturn. It successfully accomplished these missions. By 1995, Pioneer 11 could no longer power its detectors. During that year, NASA officially ended Pioneer 11's mission on September 30th, after receiving the last signal from the spacecraft. Now the probe is headed toward the constellation of Aquila, which is situated northwest of the constellation Sagittarius. The distance between Pioneer 11 and Earth is now more than 15.7 billion kilometers. If everything goes smoothly, it will pass near one of the Sagittarius stars in about 4 million years. Hopefully, this probe still rocks out there. And now our number three, New Horizons. This one has quite an impressive speed, 58,500 kilometers per hour. It's the only probe from this list launched in the 21st century, more precisely, in 2006. New Horizons flew 12,500 kilometers above the surface of Pluto. It's the first spacecraft that explored the dwarf planet. 
After completing the Pluto flyby in 2015, it changed its trajectory four times and headed towards Arakoth, a trans-Neptunian object in the Kuiper Belt. After that passage, it still has the power to be operational until the 2030s. Alan Stern, the principal investigator of the New Horizons mission, suggests that the third flyby can be done in the 2020s at the outer edges of the Kuiper Belt. Anyway, a suitable object for that is yet to be found. Now the probe is about 6.6 .6 billion kilometers away from the Earth, speeding deeper into the Kuiper Belt. Okay. As you can see, these probes were, to say the least, legendary. But we still have two more left. Let's get to know our main stars. Voyagers. This one is Voyager 2, launched in August of 1977, at a speed of 56,000 kilometers per hour. It also reached Jupiter and Saturn, and then was able to continue its journey to Uranus and Neptune it still remains the only spacecraft that visited either of these two ice planets. On November 5, 2018, Voyager 2 entered interstellar space. And the most amazing thing, we're still in contact with it through NASA Deep Space Network. At this moment, it's more than 18.9 billion kilometers away from our planet. If nothing happens to it, then in 40,000 years, Voyager should pass near the star Ross 248, at a distance of 1.7 light years. And finally, Voyager 1. This artificial object was launched in September 1977, 16 days after its twin, Voyager 2. Why in that order? Well, the thing is, Voyager 2 had a longer path. Voyager 1, on the other hand, took a shorter trajectory, which allowed it to reach Jupiter sooner. So it appears that the probes were named for the order they would arrive at Jupiter, not the order they were launched. Voyager 1 still receives routine commands and return data. Now it's more than 22.7 billion kilometers away from the Earth. It managed to go further than any other object ever created by a human being. It's the same distance as it would be if we flew to the moon and back around 30,000 times. Back in 1990, engineers turned off the spacecraft's camera to save power. But before that, it was commanded by NASA to turn its camera around and to take a photograph of Earth across a great expanse of space at the request of scientist and author Carl Sagan. Yes, that's how the amazing photo I showed you before, Pale Blue Dot, was created. The phrase was suggested by Sagan himself. Later, he wrote a book of the same name. Voyager 1 is headed toward the star Gliese 445, which is located 17.6 light years from Earth. In about 40,000 years, Voyager 1 will be closer to it than to our Sun. Well, seems like it's going to be one hell of a ride. By the way, you can check the distance of the Voyagers from the Sun and the Earth on NASA's official website. It's updated in real time. Anyway, it's never enough for us, right? We've been fantasizing about flying to the stars from ancient times. So the main question is, can we go even farther in a little time? Can interstellar travel happen anytime soon? Paul M. Sutter, an astrophysicist at The Ohio State University, says that according to physical laws only, it's possible. But there are still a lot of obstacles. Our technologies are still not very suitable for that kind of travel. The probes that now leave our solar system were not initially made for that. As you see, with their current speeds, it will take them millions of years to reach any star. But even if we initially sent a spacecraft to our closest neighbor, Proxima Centauri, it would take about 80,000 years to reach it with the current possible speed. What is the possible solution? Well, first we should increase the speed. If a spacecraft achieves at least one-tenth of the speed of light, then we will be able to reach Proxima Centauri in a few decades and even get pictures a few years later. Secondly, we should be able to provide a sufficient amount of fuel. Carrying it on the spacecraft is an option, but it makes the object heavier and therefore seriously affects the speed. Another idea is providing energy to the spacecraft while it travels. In theory, it's actually possible with the use of lasers. Radiation is very good for transporting energy especially if we're talking about the vast space distances. The object will capture the energy and propel itself forward. 
But when will we be able to create this kind of laser and spacecraft? Well, currently, we have the Breakthrough Starshot project actively working on it. One of its board members, entrepreneur Yuri Milner, suggests that the first craft can launch around 2036. Given that it will take 20 to 30 years to complete the journey to Proxima Centauri, and then around four years to receive the message from it, I guess some of us have a good chance to become witnesses of that great scientific breakthrough. But before that, there's so much we can learn about space. We've always had a special relationship with Mars. Humans wondered, are there any living creatures on it? Is it suitable for life? And if so, will humans ever be able to inhabit it? Well, it seems like we'll get all the answers very soon. In the summer of 2020, NASA was actively preparing for a really big event. It took place on July 30th, when one rover with a small helicopter left Earth and flew in the direction of the Red Planet. That's how the Mars 2020 mission was officially launched. The journey took 203 days. In that time, Rover traveled around 471 million kilometers. On February 18, 2021, it landed safely in the Jezero crater on Mars. A few moments later, NASA already received pictures of the planet's surface. In a few days afterward, on February 22, the agency published the video of the landing. According to NASA, it's taken by several cameras that are a part of the rover's entry, descent, and landing suite. This is the first time we got such a high-quality video showing the last kilometers of the rover's trip. The amazing footage immediately became the hottest topic on the internet. Putting aside global problems for a minute, humanity was admiring high-quality photos and videos from another world that is yet to be discovered. At that moment, it was clear. We are witnessing another breakthrough that may forever shift our perspective about the Red Planet. Anyway, the Mars 2020 mission is obviously not only about taking photos and videos on Mars, although they are truly remarkable. The rover Perseverance and the small robotic helicopter Ingenuity have very bold goals. They are going to look for signs of ancient life. Besides that, the rover will collect samples of rock and regolith, which can be potentially returned to Earth during the Mars Sample Return mission. Also, there is going to be a testing of the technologies required for future robotic and crewed missions. Yes, you heard that right, crewed missions. The Perseverance will prepare the ground for future human expeditions to Mars. It will make some measurements in order to understand any hazards posed by Martian dust. Also, it will try out the technology of producing a small amount of pure oxygen from Martian atmospheric carbon dioxide. How amazing is that? But that's not all. Perseverance carries a little solar-powered helicopter called Ingenuity. Its main mission is to prove the possibility of powered flight in the thin Martian atmosphere. Yeah, it's not as easy as it may seem. The red planet has lower gravity, but its atmosphere is just 1% as thick. So there, it's harder to generate lift. But that's not the only challenging condition. The Martian surface gets about half the amount of the solar energy that reaches Earth during its daytime. So during nighttime, temperatures can drop up to minus 90 degrees Celsius, which can be crucial for unprotected electrical components. In order to fit in the rover Perseverance, the Ingenuity helicopter must be small. Now it's barely 50 centimeters in height. To fly in the red planet's environment, it must be light. So its weight is 1.8 kilograms. To survive the freeze of Martian nights, it must have enough energy to power internal heaters. 
everything from the performance of the rotors and rarefied air to its solar panels and electrical heaters has been tested and retested in the vacuum chambers and test labs of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. The engineers really did a great and never before seen job. As Mars Helicopter Chief Engineer at JPL, Bob Ballarum said, every step we have taken since this journey began six years ago has been uncharted territory in the history of aircraft. And while getting deployed to the surface will be a big challenge, surviving that first night on Mars alone without the rover protecting it and keeping it powered will be an even bigger one. The performance of Ingenuity during experimental flights will help to understand if it's reasonable to consider small helicopters for future Mars missions. Flights would give scientists a new perspective on Martian geology and allow them to research areas that are steep or slippery for the rovers. At the moment of production of our video, the Perseverance has already spent more than a month on the surface of Mars. During these few weeks, scientists have spotted many interesting details on the received materials. Let's view them together and see what this badass rover achieved in just 30-something days. Pictures tell a thousand words. But wait, it's not the first time when a human-created object landed on Mars and sent us a color photo. So what's all the fuss about? Well, first, the place where the Perseverance settled. The precision landing technology was significantly improved. Thanks to that, the rover landed in a very interesting area, Jezero Crater. Scientists speculate that around 3.5 billion years ago, it was a 250 meter deep lake. Jezero also features a prominent river delta. The sediments in it can include carbonates and hydrated silica which on Earth preserve microscopic fossils for billions of years. Second, the quality of the received materials this time was on a completely different level. No joke, it has 23 cameras. Unlike the previous rovers, it takes mostly color photos. And now we'll show you the most interesting shots by Perseverance. This is the first photo taken by the rover after the landing. It was made by one of the hazard cameras, which is partially obscured by a protective cover. In the picture, we can notice the rocks and the shadow of Perseverance. But the next photo from the rover gives us a much better view. This high-resolution color picture was taken on the underside of the rover shortly after landing. Hazard cameras also took an image featuring the surface of Mars and one of the six wheels of the Perseverance. And here, we can see the first 360-degree panorama taken on February 20th by the navigation cameras, stitched together from six separate images. Just a day later, on February 21st, Master Cam Z took more detailed panorama, where we can notice many interesting details. In the distance, we can see a wind-carved rock. Also, this shot shows the rim of the Jezero Crater, by the way, this panorama was stitched together on Earth from 142 images. Another picture taken on February 22nd shows us the area of the delta of the supposed ancient river. Yes, you can see it right in the middle, that raised area of dark brown rock. Indeed, breathtaking view. Now let's see what exactly Perseverance was studying during his first month on Mars. For the first analysis, it used the SuperCam instrument, which zaps rocks with a laser to vaporize small portions and study their chemical makeup. Here, you can see the first target of the SuperCam. The length of rock is about 73 centimeters. It was called Ma'az, which is the Navajo word for Mars. The rock was found to be basaltic. It contains a lot of magnesium and iron which is common for volcanic forms. So Ma'az can be igneous. Another version is that it consists of igneous grains cemented together in a watery environment. Anyway, nothing's clear yet. Scientists still need to do more research on the area with other techniques to get more data. 
The second target, called YIGO, was also analyzed by the SuperCam instrument. According to the head of the laser instrument team, Roger Weens, this rock shows signs of having water locked up in its minerals. By the way, new NASA-funded research that used data from multiple NASA Mars exploration program missions shows that between 30 and 99% of the water on Mars is trapped within minerals in the planet's crust. These recent studies challenge the theory about water escaping into space due to the red planet's low gravity. Okay, as you see, NASA has some mind-blowing visuals of Mars, and it feels like we are on the edge of big discoveries. But there's one more thing that we specifically saved for the dessert, and that's the recording of the sounds from Mars. For the next minute, we recommend you to use headphones. The sounds were recorded by the microphone of the Perseverance on February 20th, 2021. In the next set, you can mostly hear sounds of the rover. In the second set, the sound was a bit filtered to make the sounds for Mars more audible. You can even hear the wind. Congratulations, you just heard how the red planet sounds. By the way, it was the first time a Mars rover has been equipped with a microphone. Now, NASA regularly publishes more sounds from Mars. We'll leave the link to the recordings below. So, what's next? Now, the scientists continue to test the instruments. So there won't be any significant experiments until June at the earliest. Also, they are preparing for something really big, the first helicopter flight on another planet. Over time, the rover is going to deploy an arsenal of tools, such as a drill bit, a close-up camera, and chemical sensors. They're going to search for the signs of past life in the Martian rocks. For now, Perseverance has to drive to a suitable spot for the testing of the helicopter ingenuity. Most likely, it will be a rocky place not far away from the current location of the rover. After finding the spot, Perseverance will lower the helicopter from its belly, drive off, and take a video of the first flight. And that is going to be another historic event which we are going to witness very soon. Our planet Earth's radius is estimated to be around 6,371 kilometers but I doubt that this matters to you. Since an average person has nothing to compare these scales and distances to, they can hardly imagine them accurately. They're so broad that it's difficult to comprehend them. But let's give it a shot. Consider our Earth to be the size of a tennis ball, and reducing all other dimensions to a specified scale, we get the following illustrative figures. The sun would be about one kilometer away from the tennis ball, and would appear as a sphere with a diameter of a five-story house. Isn't that impressive? But that's not all. Our galaxy's biggest stars have a diameter of around 2,500 times that of the Sun. In our case, such a star will have the size of three diameters of the actual size of Earth. Please keep in mind that the Earth is the size of a tennis ball. Nevertheless, even on such a small scale, the distance to the closest star is difficult to comprehend, since it is around 220,000 kilometers, or roughly half of the distance to the moon. Let's try again. If we were to shrink the sun's scale to that of a colorless blood cell, leukocyte, our Milky Way would fill about the same space as the United States. As previously stated, such scale play lets you transform numbers and degrees that are meaningless to the average person into visual representations. And these are far from the largest objects and distances in the universe. There are some which are considerably more extensive and more massive. 
What exactly are these objects? Where did they originate from? The Chandra X-ray Observatory was launched into a 64-hour orbit by NASA aboard the Columbia Space Shuttle in 1999. Chandra is sensitive to X-ray sources, which are 100 times weaker than what any previous X-ray telescope could detect due to the absence of an atmosphere that absorbs the vast majority of X-rays and the high angular resolution of its mirrors. Back then, they thought the telescope would only operate for five years but in reality, it still works today. As a result, Chandra was able to join the fleet of the great observatories. The Chandra X-ray Center, which operates the satellite, processes the data and distributes it to scientists worldwide for study, is housed at the Smithsonian Institution Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This telescope was designed to detect X-rays from extremely hot areas of the universe, such as exploded stars, galaxy clusters, and matter surrounding black holes. Chandra holds four highly sensitive mirrors that are nestled inside one another. The high-energy X-rays pass through the hollow shells and concentrate on electronic detectors at the end of a 9.2-meter optical bench. Highly detailed images or spectra of the cosmic source can be collected and analyzed depending on which detector is used astronomers may have discovered the most distant supermassive black hole with a jet which was detected in X-rays using NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory in early March 2021. The jet's source is PJ352-15, a quasar, a rapidly expanding supermassive black hole at the core of a young galaxy located around 12.7 billion kilometer light years from Earth. This finding could shed light on how the largest black holes in the universe formed so early in their existence. On the lower left, matter orbits around a supermassive black hole in the disk. As soon as it loses enough speed and energy, the matter may fall further inward and cross the so-called event horizon, the point of no return demonstrated by the black disk. Meanwhile, as seen on the right side of the illustrations, some of this matter is diverted away from the black hole in a narrow beam or jet. Magnetic fields fuel these high-velocity jets of energetic particles, which can cause a disc-breaking effect as energy is extracted from the system. This is one of the primary ways in which the matter in the disc loses energy, consequently increasing the rate of black hole expansion. The X-ray data from Chandra of PJ352-15 has been put together with optical and infrared data from the Gemini North and Keck-1 telescopes on the inset of this image. Astronomers used Chandra's keen vision to keep an eye on PJ352-15 for three days to trace evidence for the X-ray jet. Chandra detected X-ray emission 160,000 light-years away from the quasar in the same direction as much shorter jets in radio waves. In contrast, the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. Since only the brightest part of the jet is detectable with the observation time used, the Chandra results do not present the jet as continuous. The X-rays discovered from the jet in PJ352-15 were generated when the universe was only 0.98 billion years old, constituting approximately a tenth of its current age. The level of the remains of the cosmic microwave background radiation, CMB, post the Big Bang was significantly higher at the time compared to now. As the electrons in the jet accelerate away from the black hole, they move through and come into collision with photons that compromise the CMB radiation, amplifying the photon's energy into the X-ray range, which Chandra is able to trace. In contrast to radio waves, the light of X-rays is substantially increased in this case, which goes in line with the finding that the massive X-ray jet feature has no radio emission associated with it. How did supermassive black holes in this early epoch of the universe evolve so rapidly to reach such a considerable mass? To this day, this remains one of the most important issues in astronomy. 
given their overwhelming gravity and frightening notoriety, black holes do not always swallow everything that comes too close. It's difficult for a child to move towards the center of a playground merry-go-round if it's going too fast, so someone or something needs to slow it down," said Thomas Connor of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, in Pasadena, California, who led the research. We believe jets will detract enough energy away from supermassive black holes to allow matter to fall inward, initiating the growth of black holes. PJ352-15 is the first object to break two separate astronomical records. Firstly, the longest jet previously detected from the first billion years after the Big Bang was just around 5,000 light years long, consistent with PJ352-15's observations. Secondly, PJ352-15 is approximately 300 million light years away from the previous farthest X-ray jet discovered. The duration of this jet is important because it indicates that the supermassive black hole driving it has been rising for a long time," said Max Planck Institute for Astronomy, MPIA co-author Eduardo Bados of Heidelberg, Germany. This finding emphasizes how X-ray studies of distant quasars are important for understanding the growth of the most distant supermassive black holes, says the team. Our findings indicate that X-ray observations can be one of the most effective methods for studying quasars with jets in the early universe said JPL co-author Daniel Stern. To put it another way, future X-ray observations could hold the key to unraveling the mysteries of our cosmic past. Quasar PJ352-15 was revealed in 2018, and at the time of its reveal, it was the loudest radio quasar, the longest jet of particles ever recorded coming from Quasar PJ352-15 makes up an astronomical record by a huge margin, as the jet of particles previously tracked by astronomers was only 5,000 light years in length. Making up about 10% of the overall quasar population, radio loud quasars are some of the largest and most ancient objects in the universe which were discovered by man. The X-ray jet from PJ352-15 hit an observational distance record at the time of its discovery. NASA's Chandra is definitely humanity's most powerful X-ray observatory, and it's viewed everything from pulsars to colliding gas to galaxy clusters and supermassive black holes. Chandra also recorded the largest X-ray jet in the known universe, which is possessed by Pictor A a radio loud galaxy some 485 million light years away. Chandra took a look at it with the X-ray eyes, and the finding was beyond belief. Pictor A's jet of 300,000 light years long was discovered. This is another record-setting X-ray jet discovery by Chandra. Most likely, this is not the limit for exciting findings from the Chandra X-ray Observatory and other observatories worldwide, as the curiosity of astronomers drives them to keep pushing forward, and the most remarkable discoveries await us ahead. As Neil deGrasse Tyson said in Death by Black Hole and Other Cosmic Quandaries, not only do we live among the stars, the stars live within us. We will definitely tell you about them and keep you posted. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to our channel and press the like button.